Good morning. This is the 13th, sorry, the 16th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Um, now, in light of the terrible events in Manchester, we will commence proceedings today with a moment's silent reflection. Thank you. May I start this part of the meeting by asking everyone to turn their electrical devices to silent or turn them off if they will interfere with the sound system. Um, for our visitors, there's no need to press any buttons. The microphones will be operated by the sound desk. Now, I have apologies from committee member Dean Lockhart, and one of our guests today, Duncan Burt, has been unavoidably delayed and will join us as soon as he is able. The, the first item on the agenda is item one, which is a decision by the committee to take items seven and eight in private. Are we agreed yes, on that? Thank you. Now, we will go to our evidence session, and uh, we'd simply remind members to keep their questions short and to the point and ask if our witnesses could attempt to do so likewise. Now, we have quite a number on our guest panel today, and not all of you will want to uh, come in on every question, so no doubt you can indicate just by raising your hand if you wish to come in on a particular question or point. So we'll start off by asking each of our guests to introduce themselves and if they could just very briefly state their name, uh, their organization they're here to represent and also what that organization does. And I'll start with Joan McNaughton who's sitting on my right. Thank you very much, uh, convener, and uh, thank you for uh, the invitation. Um, I chair the Climate Group, which is a global NGO uh, working with governments like Scotland on uh, delivering ambitious climate reduction targets. And I sit on several academic boards and on uh, some business boards too. Okay. Uh, good morning. I am Lindsay Roberts. I'm the Senior Policy Manager at Scottish Renewables. Uh, Scottish Renewables is a trade association for companies working in renewable energy in Scotland. We represent around 270 members working right across the renewable sector. Good morning. I'm Nicholas Gavins, Chief Executive of Community Energy Scotland, a registered Scottish charity. We have about 400 non-profit distributing community members and our role is to build confidence, resilience and wealth at community level through sustainable energy development and many of our members are, are involved in one way or another in energy projects across Scotland. Lawrence Slade, Chief Executive of Energy UK. Uh, we represent uh, a very broad, diverse mix of generating companies with interests from hydro through to gas, uh, renewables, wind, onshore, offshore, and nuclear, etc. But also uh, around 22 supply businesses in the energy and gas, electricity and gas sector, for example, Spark Energy through to the likes of SSE. Uh, I'm Gina Hanrahan, Acting Head of Policy at WWF Scotland. We're part of a global environmental network, a uh, global environmental NGO, um, and we uh, predominantly work on uh, providing policy solutions for a uh, low-carbon future for Scotland. Climate and energy policy are our core focuses here, though we also work on marine policy, uh, and delivering the Climate Change Act is, is our core agenda. 
Hello, I'm Mark Winskill. I'm a Senior Research Fellow at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I also work for the UK Energy Research Centre, which is a UK-wide independent, uh, publicly funded, uh, university-based uh, whole systems interdisciplinary energy research centre. I'm also a Director of Climate Exchange, which is the Scottish uh, publicly funded, government-funded uh, intermediary between the research and policy community on climate change in Scotland. Um, thank you very much. Uh, if I might start with a, a general question to our guests today. Uh, we're here to discuss the draft Scottish Government Energy Strategy. And my first question is, well, just to see what the panel's views are on the priorities that are set out in the draft strategy uh, for energy supply over the coming decades. I'm just wondering who would like to come in on that first. Um, Lindsay Roberts. Yep. Uh, so at Scottish Renewables, we very much welcome the publication of the strategy. Um, we welcome the priorities that are set out through it, and we welcome the vision. Uh, in particular, we are very pleased to see the 50% all energy target proposed in there. That is something that Scottish Renewables proposed uh, ahead of the Scottish parliamentary elections, and we were delighted to see that get cross-party uh, support within the, the parties of the Scottish Parliament. So really pleased to see that in there. I think our main overarching comment on it, though, is that the targets are ambitious. We believe they're ambitious and feasible, but it's difficult to see from reading the strategy at the moment exactly how we're going to achieve them. So we think the strategy needs to look at slightly more detailed action plans that will show us uh, the pathways and the very practical steps that need to be taken in order to realise those priorities and that vision. Thank you. And Joan McNaughton. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I entirely endorse uh, what Lindsay has said. Um, and I was very struck that the uh, level of detail in the energy strategy was somewhat lower than in the climate change plan. And I think one has to read the two together, uh, not least because of the importance of the priority given to energy efficiency, which uh, is given good prominence but um, may become even more important if some of the other priorities prove to be um, uh, slightly difficult to achieve to the full extent set out in the strategy. The energy efficiency area is one where uh, the Scottish Government has relatively more uh, control. Uh, and so that may well be the area where, um, uh, even though it's very ambitious, uh, there could be, if you will, um, a safety valve uh, to compensate for lack of achievement. I'd just like to make one comment. Uh, there is, I think there will be quite a debate about whether there should be new thermal power generation. I know there are different views on that. Um, I think that merits further thought. Uh, the... Um, technologies for managing uh, a system with a huge penetration of renewables are moving forward by leaps and bounds, uh, not just uh, on the digital side, but uh, also some of the uh, technologies in actually ramping up batteries and so forth, storage. So uh, it may be that whatever amount of support for renewables is now thought to be necessary uh, in the future, that will be relatively less so. Uh, Mark Winskill. Yeah, uh, so uh, it's interesting that your question actually was about supply, uh, which is the first question on the strategy consultation. Um, so the, the, the first question is, uh, <coughs> of, the, of the 17 questions on the energy strategy, the first question is, what are the priorities uh, for energy supply over the coming decades? Uh, what, what we were, um, I, I mean, I, I think what we have from, from the government is, is a... Um, is an effort at integrated energy strategy making, which doesn't really do the job of integration all that successfully in the in the draft strategy document. So what we have um, is a kind of rather disaggregated presentation of the energy system. We start with uh, a lot of information on supply, a lot of information on the characterization of the current system. Um, it is a quite a short document compared to the climate change plan. Um, there is no real integrated analysis of what kind of energy system. Um, so the energy strategy is looking towards 2050. Uh, the climate change plan was looking to the period uh, 20, to 2032. 
So the climate change plan is a sort of mid-term in energy terms, uh, quite long in terms of political timescales, I realise, but uh, 2030 is our sort of mid-term for the energy transition and um, 2050 is the sort of long-term transition by which we should be uh, essentially running a decarbonised system. So what, would, what we'd really have liked to see is a kind of join-up between the climate change plan and the energy strategy in that you have a kind of... Uh, we're on the road to the 2050 vision in the, in the climate change plan and then we, we see how the long-term picture looks. Now, obviously, when you're discussing anything in 2050, given Jones correctly said, things are very dynamic in terms of uh, distributed generation and storage and so on. Um, it's very much a kind of a, a world of um, managing uncertainties, keeping some options open where they look promising, understanding what the key decision points are on the transition. Um, all that really requires a kind of integrated view of the whole energy system, which spans what levels of demand might we be expecting, um, how successfully can we get demand down, uh, how, how much improvement can we get on efficiency right across the system, you know, from, from upstream, downstream, into, into homes and so on. Um, that's quite difficult to do, of course, but the Scottish Government did commission a whole systems energy model to allow them to kind of understand the, 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 the basic kind of evolution of the system over time. And it's quite a, a familiar model for any of us who've been doing whole systems research. Um, it's the same kind of basic model that's been used by the Committee on Climate Change for many years and uh, the UK Energy Research Centre for many years. So um, I think we have to say, in terms of how the information is presented to us, um, it isn't as integrated as we might have hoped, given that there is a, a, an integrated kind of approach to things. So um, that that's, you know, it makes it rather difficult to kind of uh, have, a, have a kind of evidence-based discussion about what we think are the priorities and so on. Um, so I'd call for, and, and I know this is the draft statement, I'd call for a much more kind of integrated, holistic kind of statement based on some of the analysis that, that's been possible through the, the new model and lots of other evidence. Uh, and I think that's the only way we can really understand how much effort is likely to be needed on supply side, how much effort is is likely to be available to us on demand side, what kind of networks, what kind of scale of system evolution. None of these things are easy, but uh, we do have to kind of strive to put these all against each other in terms of the least cost way of achieving system transition. Thank you. And Lawrence Slade. I think Mark makes some very good points there. I think we would echo the point around you need a whole system approach. And I think while the overall priorities of, uh, of the report are are definitely supported. I think the way that you're seeing technologies um, come together, it's absolutely essential uh, that you consider the interactions between heat, power, and transport in particular. And I think there's an element of requirement here uh, that Mark was touching on, I think, around how you can future-proof uh, the system work that you're doing. When you're looking at the period of time we are out to 2050, also, the speed of technical development that we're seeing. Well, for the last few years, 15, I think, actually, we've seen reducing electricity demand. If we see significant uptake of EVs and if we see significant uptake of electrification of heat, you could see that demand curve going the other way. So it's absolutely critical that you have a intense look at energy efficiency, how you're managing the housing stock in Scotland, but it's also really important how you look at how all the various technologies can work together to provide a system that really supports Scotland going forward into the future. Thank you. And Nicholas Gobbins. We strongly uh, welcome the priorities in the strategy. Uh, we feel that the whole question of local supply, in other words, the direct supply from local generators to local demand, would benefit from a, a clearer vision of how that can be developed um, and also uh, a clearer sort of strategic um, uh, process to cover both the technical issues of matching local uh, generation and local demand as well as the financial, the contractual uh, and the commercial arrangements necessary to make that happen. But we think the prize uh, is, is quite a significant um, impact on local economies. Uh, we think the potential there is significant. Thank you. And Gina Hanrahan. Uh, 
Uh, we very much welcome the strategy. I think it's a very exciting uh, attempt at a much more integrated approach uh, to mapping our energy system for the future. Um, we're particularly uh, uh, happy that the 50% target has been set for 2030 um, as an all energy target, which we think will drive significant growth in the heat and transport sectors and do for those sectors what the electricity target has done in the past for the electricity sector. So that's very significant. Um, we advocated that for the last uh, number of years and we produced a report uh, together with Friends of the Earth Scotland and RSPB Scotland based on independent analysis by Ricardo AEA that showed that that 50% target is feasible and necessary to deliver on climate change targets, but it's feasible within existing technologies. I think we'd agree with Lindsay that uh, we'd like to see a little bit more detail in the strategy in terms of the uh, roadmaps for particular sectors, uh, specifically in heat and transport. I think there's a, a lack of clarity around uh, the pathways for those sectors. Um, and we would like to see more actions to deliver on them. Of course, this can't be read as a document in isolation from the Climate Change Plan, which is its sister document. But even within the Climate Change Plan, there is not perhaps sufficient uh, detailed actions to deliver on the ambitions for heat and transport particularly. Um, so we'd like to see, for instance, on heat, um, much more action uh, to in, in the off-gas grid sector, where we know we can uh, get going quickly. Um, we would like to see more action on uh, heat decarbonisation organization for new builds, um, which isn't built into the draft climate change plan because there's no point locking ourselves into a, a situation uh, where we'd have to expensively retrofit new build properties. And we'd like to see a quick rollout of uh, district heating networks. That's something the government is making uh, good progress on. And we'd like to see that uh, uh, move forward into primary legislation now. Uh, thank you very much. I'll now come on to a question from Gillian Martin. Thank you, convener. We're looking at the, the, the actions that have been set out in relation to the five uh, key priorities. There's quite a lot that's actually requiring collaboration with the UK government. Um, and, and given that the UK government's energy strategy, um, well, the, the UK government as was, obviously we don't know who's going to be the UK government in a few days' time, um, it seems to be the two strategies seem to be diverging the uk government having more of a, an emphasis on things like shale gas and nuclear energy i mean how how how, uh, how realizable is the, the 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 scottish government strategy with 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 that in the background um nicholas gubbins uh, from our perspective which is around the whole community energy side uh, there is a disconnect between uh, certain aspects of the Scottish Government's strategy, uh, given that they don't have their hands on some of the levers that are necessary to affect change. So, for example, in the whole area of electricity regulation, clearly that's a reserved matter. However, on the other hand, uh, we have seen in practice, in the nitty-gritty of uh, development work, there is a reasonably strong shared agenda on some of the issues. So I think Scotland has demonstrated a lot of practical development and innovation activity which the UK government uh, is interested in and Ofgem is interested in. So whilst it does appear to be frustrating that disconnect, it's not a wholly um, negative thing in that there is scope to influence some of the aspects of the reserve matters in the UK. Uh, Mark Winskull. Yeah, I, I, so I think this is a major issue. Um, I think the, the publication of the draft climate change plan and the, uh, the draft energy strategy together, if you look at the kind of timescales for delivery, particularly in the climate change plan, because there is a sense of uh, what needs to happen by, by when in the climate change plan, um, what, what they indicate is that there is an emerging kind of difference in, between governments now which is probably for the first time we've seen this since the passage of the Climate Change Acts in both, 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 both governments. So um, it raises a lot of questions in terms of deliverability, uh, socialization of, of costs, um, and so on. So, you know, up, up till now, we've had a, a very kind of clear kind of level of alignment between governments so that some of the things that Scottish Government are, are rightly kind of proud of in terms of decarbonisation and of, of the electricity sector and the expansion of renewables has, has been, you know, very sort of significantly dependent on 
a similar direction of travel from both governments. Um, so we have to th think through that a little bit, I think. Uh, the UK government, uh, as was uh, and, and took the dissolution, did accept uh, the fifth carbon budget advice of the Committee on Climate Change. So uh, at the highest level, there is still a commitment to um, a decarbonisation transition for the energy system. I think beyond that, there are lots of kind of questions about the extent to which UK government will support um, things which are you know, quite heavily built into the energy strategy in the climate change plan. So on electricity, uh, carbon capture and storage is, 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 is there in the Scottish government's climate change plan as early as uh, 20, the mid-2020s, and then allowing for a heavy kind of, well, you know, it, it, it becomes what they call a negative emissions factor, because if you use carbon capture and storage with bioenergy, uh, you get a kind of negative bonus in your carbon budget. Um, UK government latest projections show um, no CCS. This is the um, the new department, the Bayes department's uh, central projections for 2035 show no CCS on the system, I think. Uh, so there's a concern there. I think the other concern is around uh, heat, where the Scottish government's plans are, I would say, several years ahead in terms of the, the pace of the transition. Uh, I'm talking about low carbon heat supply. Um, from where the UK government and also the Committee on Climate Change imagine the heat transition. So we have a, a UK version of energy system change now, um, which if we look at what the Committee on Climate Change is saying for the UK, as well as some indications, we haven't had a, an, a comprehensive statement from the UK government um, on the emissions reduction plan. We're going to have to wait longer for that now. But we've had some in indications from the industrial strategy green paper and other other statements about what what the kind of flavor of uk policy is likely to be and uh, i think you know uh, uh not it, it's partly about the pace of change in that the uk government is 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 some years behind where the scottish government wants to be um but it's also the direction of travel so you know clearly the uk government as was well intends no further support for onshore wind and that's quite a big element of the Scottish transition. So uh, quite what that means in terms of affordability, deliverability, uh, the relationship between governments, um, I think these are very significant kind of questions going ahead. Joan McNaughton. Uh, thank you very much. I, um, I agree with a lot of what Mark has said, but not with everything. Um, we have across Europe a situation in which individual countries have different approaches to their supply mix. And actually, that in itself is not a bad thing. So some countries will have nuclear, some won't. Uh, and um, that gives you diversity across the, that area. Uh, so I wouldn't be too concerned about a different approach to supply subject to this. Uh, clearly, the way in which you manage the connections between the two countries matters enormously. Uh, the, um, that's one of the issues in Europe, where um, if one country uh, has an excess of renewables and exports that excess uh, to other countries, they can find the economic case for some of their uh, investments undermined. So as Scotland's a, a net exporter, that's not likely to be a, a problem for Scotland as such. Uh, but there will be issues around the approach to regulation and the approach to support. But in terms of having a different mix, I wouldn't uh, uh, think that's uh, the, the main thing. Where I do agree with Mark is that the approach to uh, um, attribution of costs is absolutely crucial. And this will matter because uh, when you have different mixes, then different approaches to attribution of cost, in particular how much of the system cost the renewable sector has to bear, uh, could matter and could be an impedance. Um, I also think uh, the um, uh, uh, support uh, systems matter more in some areas than in others. Uh, I would think it matters more in relation to some of the newer technologies, uh, um, the marine technologies in particular and uh, offshore wind, uh, even though prices are, are falling fast in the offshore wind sector. Onshore wind, um, I, 
you know, we're, we're not far away from being able to achieve subsidy-free uh, um, onshore wind um, projects. Uh, and there, I think we come back to this uh, issue of uh, cost and transmission cost and so forth, which could damage competitiveness if there were a, a, a rather crude approach to location, uh, because obviously um, there is a principle about having the sources located as near as possible to the demand. Uh, but in, in relation to wind, that doesn't make sense because some of the best sources of wind are remote. My final point in this area is um, uh, on carbon capture and storage, which I've been working on uh, since I was in the UK government uh, as long ago as 2003. And I think th that one will matter because I do not detect that the Scottish government has uh, uh, confidence that it would be able to afford uh, the money for a large-scale demonstrator of carbon capture and storage in the power sector. Um, and and uh, I don't know that we are likely to succeed in having the UK government uh, um, reverse its rather curious decision to abandon the support for carbon capture and storage. Um, that matters a lot in relation to the power sector, but I note the energy strategy does say that the uh, Scottish Government will look for opportunities to support small-scale demonstrations, particularly in industry. And this is one of the problems with carbon capture and storage, that everybody thinks it's about coal, whereas in fact it's going to be needed for gas-fired power generation, but more than in the power sector, it's actually going to be needed in industrial processes where you don't have alternative technologies the way you do have renewables in the power sector. So I think that's probably one of the most difficult areas, and it's one where um, maybe the, the strategy needs to think uh, a little harder about uh, how to get access to um, the uh, um, uh, results of demonstrations of carbon capture and storage abroad. And Lindsay Roberts. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think this actually links into some of the answers we had for the first question um, around understanding those action plans and those pathways. And what I'd like to see, and I think Mark uh, mentioned this before as well, is understanding... So part, part of the problem is the strategy is deliberately quite flexible to enable lots of technologies and to future-proof and make sure that you're not um, shutting off options prematurely. Um, but you, there will be some points where we have to make some critical decisions that will shut off options. So I think we need to understand what those critical decision points are along that pathway out to 2030 and out to 2050 and, and who owns those decisions. I think that's the really important bit. So it's not necessarily just the UK government, there's other regulated sectors that are in there as well, and then what the Scottish government's role in each of those decision points is as well. And I think that would help us um, answer some of the problems that we raise in, in relation to the first question um, as well as this. And, and Mark, again, I think for me, hit the nail on the head. It's not necessarily always about the direction of travel, it's the timing. So I think the timings between what the UK government and the Scottish government are trying to achieve um, in a lot of areas are slightly off, particularly around, as Mark said, the heat sector, and certainly there's issues around CCS uh, as well. So um, coming back to kind of the subsidy and the onshore wind questions, I mean, the UK government's own, own research shows that the most mature technologies, onshore wind, solar, new onshore wind and solar projects are the cheapest electricity providers that are out there, the cheapest options we have. So we think it makes sense uh, to maximise the resource and maximise utilisation of that resource that we have uh, in Scotland of our renewables capacity. Um, and that will help us uh, deal with some of the options, with some of the concerns and uncertainties that sit with the newer technologies such as CCS or renewables we think are a, a proven, a cheap, uh, low regrets option. Um, and the Scottish Government therefore has a role to make sure it's using all of the devolved policy mechanisms it has at its hand uh, to make sure that our projects are as competitive as possible when we are working within that competitive CFD um, resource allocation framework. And Gina Hanran. 
Um, I think a lot of the points that I wanted to make have been raised already, but I just wanted to uh, hone in on one. Uh, while there's a huge uh, reliance, of course, in the UK government around CCS and the future of the gas grid, onshore wind and, and other issues, I think there, this underscores the importance of doing what we can within our own powers. Um, and one area I think the strategy could benefit from more detail and perhaps more ambition is around demand reduction, and that's something that the Scottish government has a, a lot of levers to deliver. Um, so at the moment, uh, the strategy sets out that there is a forecast, I think, increase of 30% in electricity demand by 2030 as a result of heat and transport electrification. But there's very little effort to manage that demand in the first place, um, which would obviously reduce the stresses on the system. So while SEEP is, is in there and is, uh, I think, a very welcome development, we campaigned long and hard for uh, energy efficiency to be designated a national infrastructure priority, its uh, level of ambition is uh, is relatively weak. Um, it, it forecasts, I think, something in the region of a 10% overall heat demand increase from buildings rather than carrying on the level of uh, efficiency savings that we've seen over recent years. Equally in transport, um, the modelling suggests that there's going to be a 27% increase in road miles uh, through to the 2030s, and there's very little a uh, action within the plan to do anything to tackle that. There are a lot of levers that the Scottish Government has uh, to uh, enable uh, 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 demand reduction in transport. For instance, we could um, uh, bring forward the policies that are hinted at in the climate change plan around things like workplace parking levies, um, uh, air quality zones, etc., to actually manage demand. I think um, some research was done for the Scottish Government. It's probably quite a few years ago now by Atkins and Aberdeen University, which looked at various options for decarbonising the transport sector. And uh, demand reduction options came out as the, you know, the, the cheapest overall cost. Um, so I think you know, much more can be done on that aspect, and that will in turn help to alleviate the stresses on the supply side. And Lawrence Slade. Um, I think probably pick up a little bit on uh, Gina's comments, actually, uh, looking at SEEPs. And Relating back to the question where policies between UK government and Scottish government are diversifying or, or moving apart, I think the whole area of energy efficiency is one where Scotland has has actually been ahead of the game in what it's achieved uh, of late, and I think it's to be welcomed that uh, energy efficiency is being made an infrastructure priority here. I think the critical part, though, is how Scotland's energy efficiency programmes develop in relationship to how those programmes in England and Wales develop. And why I say that is because a lot of the infrastructure and supply chains are related, and a lot of the delivery mechanisms are related, and a lot of the regulatory regimes are related by what Ofgem actually uh, undertake. So whilst it's fantastic on the one hand that Scotland's taking a lead here, and I think really is setting an example, we've got to look very carefully at how that pro those programmes or that programme, how that then relates into the UK's programmes as a whole and the energy company obligation and how that functions. So I think more work is required there to make sure that uh, the lead is maintained, if you like, but the, the value that can be extracted from having a, a good, strong supply chain is maintained. Thank you. And we'll move on to a question from Bill Bowman. Um, thank you. Convener, I think some of the questions may overlap a little bit in the in the topics. We've mentioned already the um, the strategy for 2030 that all energy um, renewables target to deliver the equivalent of 50% of Scotland's heat, transport, and electricity consumption from renewable sources. Now, for 2014, figures show that about 15% of energy consumption came from renewables. And of that, renewable energy, uh, electricity made up about 50% of the total. I think uh, most people have said that they um, accept the target is um, ambitious and they welcome it. Some have said it's feasible. And I'd be interested to hear the sort of practical steps to make this feasible that you could put to individual, well, um, people in Scotland that they would find acceptable and workable, and how in this, the energy market may have to may have to develop as well. Uh, Mark Winskill. Uh, so I'm, I'll probably uh, repeat myself a bit uh, as I answer the questions. But so um, I think uh, essentially we so um, that th there's um, 
I think there's a broad welcome from many sort of stakeholders of, uh, for the for the target. Um, what we're kind of, I suppose, at the highest level, what we're interested in is the least cost path to achieve the kind of change that we need to achieve, and where targets are kind of useful, and where they're kind of you know more, more specific targets. Uh, obviously, favour whatever's being targeted in terms of you know every, every sector would like its its sort of uh, its technology to be represented with a specific target. Um, you know, so we start with the target, which is uh, uh, essentially about supply. Although I think you can achieve the target through demand reduction as well, as if if you're kind of um, maintaining a high a high kind of. Uh, a high renewables sector and reduced demand, then, then you're achieving a higher percentage of demand met by renewables. Um, it, I mean, so some of, the, some of the concerns I have about the target are, and I know uh, there'll be different views around the table, are that we haven't seen any kind of uh, modelling work from the Scottish Government or representation of what their version of, the, of meeting that target looks like. There has been some independent work using a different kind of uh, model, and uh, uh, it was conducted um, um, th through uh, WWF and others, so the Scottish government's own analysis of how we might best that uh, best meet that target, we haven't really seen. We're so not able to kind of say too much about what the implications are for different sectors. What we know already is that 2030, um, given that it's not that many years away, um, some of the sectors are better able to respond over that time than others. And I come back to heat here. So my my uh, one of my main concerns about that target is how much renewable heat it's feasible to get into the Scottish system by 2030. And if the 50% if the target means that we have unrealistic assumptions about how much low carbon heat, heat supply, renewable heat supply, we can achieve by that time, um, then I would have concerns. It, it's, it's a little bit difficult because we haven't seen that analysis. Uh, but we know that... Um, um, it's much easier to decarbonise electricity supply than heat supply. I think um, with, with transport, it's, it's very much connected to uh, the interconnection between electricity uh, and, and, and transport. So that, um, again, a lot can be done. I think where we might have kind of, we, w we would want to look more closely at the evidence is, you know, how much expectation there is on uh, renewable heat um, contributing that, to that target. Roberts. This is where you want me to show you my working. <laughs> there we got there. So it's um, we said it's ambitious, and it, it definitely is ambitious. But I think that's what a target should be, absolutely. And I think you need to look at the success of the hundred percent, the equivalent of hundred percent for the renewables target, uh, as well, to show uh, the role that an ambitious target like that can play in terms of driving the sector forward. Um, so we've already got just sort of around eight gigawatts of renewable energy capacity in the system. Um, we've, done a, we've done a little bit of analysis, but we um, normally use uh, WWF's work that they did with Ricardo um, as an independent bit of work as well. So I'll let Gina maybe go into the detail on that. But we think uh, by 2020, we'd be sitting around 28% uh, of our whole energy system coming from renewable energy. So another bit on top of that, up to the 50%. We think in order to achieve that, you'd need to at least double our renewable energy capacity at the moment. So most of the analysis take you into um, installed capacities around the sort of 19 gigawatt mark. And as Mark says, you're, you're absolutely right. There's lots of different ways that you can skin this cat or you can slice the cake. Um, but they generally fall out around that 19 gigawatt figure. Um, the Scottish Government's strategy at the moment suggests we'll need about 11 to 17 gigawatts of installed renewable energy capacity. Um, so we have a few questions around what that figure actually means and what it includes and how it's, uh, the analysis has come to that figure. So again, that echoes, echoes uh, Mark's points. But uh, we do have 12 gigawatts of renewables sitting already sitting in the planning system. So in that sense, add that onto our existing eight, and you're at 20 gigawatts already. I mean, it, it is an achievable target. There will be redundancy in those uh, projects that are sitting in the pipeline. There'll be projects uh, in that existing eight gigawatts that aren't repowered, that aren't renewed, so there'll be some redundancy there as well, and um, which is why we say we need to more than double 
um, but we think it is possible. And it's in line with the committee and climate change's advice as well as the lowest cost option to achieving our climate change targets. But I do think you ask a very, very good question in terms of how you communicate that to the public and the benefits of that to the public. Um, the strategy itself is quite light in those areas, um, and we think it's going to have to be supported by a very large um, sort of marketing communications plan to a degree with the energy generation. Um, you you don't need as much of that. It doesn't um, affect people's lives as quite directly as some of the things in the heat transition are going to. I mean, that, that may involve physically coming into your home and changing everything you do or how you use and live and work in your own home. So it very directly affects people and we need to get better at communicating why those changes are happening and what the benefits of those changes are. Uh, Gina Hanrahan followed by Lawrence Slade. Uh, so, just to show the committee the report that we've all been talking about. Um, so, just to take you through some of the uh, uh, assumptions and, and scenarios that we ran in this report, uh, which are uh, slightly out of kilter with some areas uh, of the Scottish Government's own work. Um, as Lindsay said, it, it, it assumes about a doubling of electricity capacity, so uh, as well within pipelines if we can find a route to market for that capacity to come through. Uh, in heat, we foresaw about a 40% uh, renewable heat penetration by 2030, so that's significantly less than the Scottish Government's 80%, 80 to 94% uh, penetration of, of low carbon heat by that stage. Um, and in transport, we saw about 18% uh, renewable co transport content by 2030. Um, that all sounds very um, uh, difficult to understand for, for ordinary people. What does that all mean? And I think that's a very, very important question. And we've tr what we've tried to do in the report is set out what that means for your real life um, in, in, in some ways. So that means that uh, heat networks are expanded in urban areas. It means that a lot of properties, I think up to half of properties, will have some form of heat pump uh, rather than gas boilers, as they do now. It means that uh, one in every two buses that we uh, get on will be electric or low carbon, um, and uh, one in three uh, cars will be electric. So there's very significant uh, advances versus where we are today. They may sound um, like you know huge steps forward, but in many countries, uh, they're already delivering uh, significant growth in these sectors. For instance, in Norway, already over 40% of new car sales are electric, and there's a lot of talk and hype at the moment about uh, the potential for uh, e electric vehicles to take off at pace. So um, it is a huge transformation, but if we put in place the right policy framework to enable and support it with clear actions, and we're very clear for the Scottish public about the direction that we're going in, I think 50% all energy isn't quite an easy one to communicate properly, we need to explain what that means, then that will in itself create the kind of uh, market drivers that will uh, allow expansion, I think, because you'll be creating that consumer demand for those kind of products. Um, I think, yeah, echo the comments around, uh, Lindsay's comments actually around the importance of onshore uh, wind. It's perfectly clear that it is the uh, the cheapest form of uh, low carbon generation and it's frankly a bit ridiculous that it doesn't feature more strongly. Um, so building on that point though, I think the committee and the Scottish Government shouldn't ignore um, the benefits that smart networks can bring. Um, now Duncan could probably talk about, about this a lot more if he was here, but I think by actually harnessing technology that's available on the grid today um, and actually using the electricity we've got available to us in a more dynamic fashion, you can actually uh, lessen the requirement for, for new generation to an extent. But I think that the main point I would make, though, is that you've actually got to use all of these elements together. And we go back to the whole system approach in how you can actually bring uh, new forms of storage on. So obviously, there's a significant amount of hydro storage up in Scotland. But actually, how can you bring battery storage into the grid? How you can, how you can combine battery storage with onshore wind so you can make better, more effective use of uh, peak um, generation? How you can combine onshore wind storage and solar so you can make better use of midday peaks uh, during the summer months, um, how you can combine that potentially with uh, hydrogen creation um, to for injection into the existing gas networks. So there's a lot of tools available um, to the likes of grid and to the likes of uh, DNOs that we can actually use to, to make the system work more efficiently for us, as we see, as, as Gina says, and as the WWF report says, we see growth um, increase. The point that I would really pick up on, though, is engagement. 
and there is a vast challenge for us all in how we engage consumers in the importance of energy efficiency. It's not a popular topic to be talked about and there is uh, an element of well, a significant amount of work required to make people understand the differences that they can make and the differences that we can help them make. We also shouldn't underestimate the challenge of actually going into every house and potentially replacing boilers with heat pumps, etc. Those are huge um, engagement barriers to actually get over. And the amount of time it will take, I think, just illustrates the challenge that uh, we could have in terms of the heat strategy. And for that, looking at the cost, the time, the engagement, it's really important that a strategy comes into play as soon as it possibly can if you're to meet the targets. Thank you. And, and perhaps very briefly, John McNaughton and then Nicholas Gubbins on this question. Thank you, convener. Um, just picking up on uh, Lawrence's point, the good news uh, uh, to the um, to that story is that there will be a huge number of jobs, but of course that creates its own challenge in building the necessary skills uh, in our, our workforce. Um, I absolutely agree about engagement, and people have talked about this in terms of uh, the willingness of the public, if you will, to uh, come along uh, on this journey. Uh, but I think there's another issue that we haven't mentioned yet and which is crucial, and that is investment. I mean, we're really talking about uh, a, an accelerated replacement of our capital stock. Um, in cars, uh, you know, the lifetime of a car is, what, 10, 15 years? So even at, you know, the exponential growth rates we're seeing on electric vehicles, we're going to need some acceleration uh, of purchase. And that's a big ask uh, of individuals. Uh, we're going to need a huge increase in investment from uh, project developers uh, across all of the sectors, not just the uh, electricity sector, but heat and transport. So you're looking at one of the biggest public and private sector uh, uh, investment challenges that we will ever have faced at an incredible pace. And so what we'll need to think about there and what the strategy, I think, doesn't really uh, tackle as uh, as, as successfully as I would like, is what the right balance is going to be between market mechanisms which will incentivise that investment and the necessary regulation to drive it forward faster than just the entrepreneurs developing the electric vehicles would. And on that, uh, I think there is, there's going to have to be a place for regulation, but the regulation is going to have to inspire confidence for people to start investing now, because those investments then have to build the capacity, the supply chains and so forth. Of course, you won't be able to get all of those regulations in exactly the right form first off. So there will have to be adaptation as circumstances evolve, adaptation as new technologies come forward. Uh, and so there will need to be some kind of confidence on the part of would-be investors that those changes are not going to be driven by political whim or irrelevant circumstances, but are going to be delivered by clearly defined triggers, like amount of penetration uh, of a particular technology when perhaps subsidy can then start to be reduced, like uh, uh, availability for new technologies when they come, uh, like when, when costs change, and perhaps signalled at specific time periods so that investors can have confidence uh, to, to make the investment, knowing that for a reasonable part of the life cycle of that investment, uh, something isn't going to come out of left field and leave them with stranded assets. To go back to your question, I, I think that the chances of meeting the targets are very low unless we have a quite a significant sort of mindset change in the way we talk about engagement or participation of people. Scot Scotland is lucky in the sense that there has got a very high level of engaged citizenry, as it were, in energy matters. And we've led on community energy uh, in the UK and in Europe to some extent. But we have to shift from this mindset about sort of basically the energy system doing things to people to a mindset where 
uh, there's much more of a sense of partnership, of development, of all the new technical opportunities for uh, uh, the way people sort of engage with the system and benefit fr from it. If we can't sort of get get that mindset change and a very active program of sort of mobilising uh, local groups and so on into engaging their local people into the whole new opportunity from energy, the scope to sort of democratise our system, the energy system, will be lost, which I think would be a tragedy. I see that we've been joined by Duncan Burt now. Welcome to this morning's session. And uh, as I've given others an opportunity to, perhaps you could simply state the name of your organisation and very briefly what it does before we move on to a question from Richard Leonard. Thank you, and uh, apologies to all of the committee for being late this morning. Um, so my name is Duncan Burt. I'm head of uh, Operate the System for National Grid. I work in the system operator section of National Grid. And... National Grid, as you know, owns the electricity uh, transmission network in England and Wales and operates the transmission network for electricity across Great Britain. And we also own and operate the gas transmission network across Great Britain. Thank you. Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. I wonder if I could um, um, press the panellists a little bit more on uh, what they've already said about onshore wind. Because um, f if my shorthand's correct... Uh, Joan McNaughton, you said that uh, we were not far away from subsidy-free onshore wind. Um, Lindsay Roberts, I think you said we need to maximise resources. So I'm kind of, I, I wonder whether, uh, perhaps beginning with Joan McNaughton, she could tell us um, more precisely how far away we are from uh, being subsidy-free in the onshore wind. And uh, maybe Lindsay Roberts could say, in her um, <clears throat> description of maximising resources, does she include in that the need for continued public subsidy for onshore wind? I hope it won't be regarded as contempt of Parliament if I say no, I can't tell you. Uh, I don't have the figures and I'm not, uh, uh, I haven't, I didn't refresh my memory on them before, before I came, so I apologise for that. Um, but I have seen quite a lot recently uh, around the, um, uh, the, the reduction in costs of onshore wind and I'm sure there are people around this table who could give you uh, a, a better, a more precise feel. But just make um, uh, a point which probably uh, Lindsay might might want to uh, uh, develop, and that is that uh, a lot of the problems around uh, getting uh, access to our, our wind resources onshore now are as much in other areas like the planning system and connections to the grid as they are about the commercial viability of onshore wind. Uh, so um, I'd be... Uh, 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 quite amazed if there weren't um, uh, onshore wind uh, projects which can survive without subsidy, uh, but they have to get through the, the hurdles of the planning system and the connections to the grid. And I think they're both impeding uh, the speed of uh, deployment. Uh, I think the, the planning issue is, is much more neuralgic uh, uh, south of the border, but I don't think it's completely absent in some uh, communities up here. Um, we actually had a report published just a couple of months ago now um, by Baringa Partners that uh, looked at this very question. So what uh, Baringa found with us, well, the start with the UK government's own figures show that, like I say, the maturest technologies, onshore wind and solar, they are now the cheapest forms of electricity production that we have. Um, so what Baringa Partners did for us was look at the costs within the pipeline. Um, and they found that we could deliver about a gigawatt of projects that are sitting in that planning pipeline at the moment um, for no cost above the wholesale market price for power. And over their lifetime, they could actually be paying back more to the public purse. So we believe that a pot one auction um, held 2018-2019, so pot one is for established technologies under the CFD regime, apologies for slipping into the technical language, so that includes the technologies like onshore wind and solar. Um, we think holding an auction under the CFD for those technologies is absolutely critical. Um, the, the key to delivery at those costs, so equivalent to the wholesale price, if not paying back more to the public purse, um, 
is that CFD mechanism and providing that low risk route to market. So we feel that's absolutely essential, that that mechanism is still there and available for onshore wind. Um, in terms of Joan's comments on the planning system, um, I'd agree I think that's a, an issue that's possibly more acute down south than it is in Scotland, but absolutely right, we're, we, we're not uh, completely clean of all sorts of planning issues up, uh, in Scotland, so accompanying the energy strategy, the Scottish Government has also published um, the onshore wind policy statement, so it sets out a variety of ideas in there for helping uh, onshore wind in Scotland be uh, competitive, but within a very robust uh, planning regime that still takes account of all the social and environmental factors and considerations that we need to. So there is an ongoing piece of work um, trying to, to look at some of those issues that we have in planning and address them at the same time as both the, the strategy itself commits and we will continue to, to commit to uh, arguing for a pot one auction. Um, I think Gordon MacDonald wanted a quick follow-up on that, and should I, uh, I should say to our witnesses that if any matter is raised, you can submit in writing uh, further information on it at a later point. So no contempt of Parliament, but the opportunity <laughs> to um, fill it in on uh, answers after today's session. Gordon MacDonald. It was just a very quick point. Um, you mentioned earlier that we need to double renewable capacity and that um, onshore wind is one of the cheapest ways to do that. Uh, you've talked about the, the difficulties with connections to the grid and planning, but I'm just wondering if there's any other economic impact that would benefit Scotland if we went down that route, i.e. in the creation of jobs, etc., in order to build that capacity to double the renewables? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we think that holding that pot one auction, delivering that extra one gigawatt of onshore winds in the system and could deliver more than a billion pounds of private sector investment. Um, I think Gina's report suggests, is it 14,000 jobs created um, it's in, that figure, in that region with, um, with the doubling of the renewable energy capacity as well. So absolutely, there are huge social and economic benefits in terms of investment and job creation to be brought around uh, by the continued deployment of renewable energy. Um, yes, I think there. Um, just just to add, um, there's one uh, proposal in the energy strategy uh, for uh, power purchase agreements, um, and I think they could help a lot, even if the pot one auction isn't uh, available. Because what we're after here, really, is as as um, Lindsay has said, is reducing risk, and so uh, that risk feeds back into the cost of capital and the cost of capital is relatively much much more important for renewables because they're high upfront capital cost and very low operating cost so i think anything that could be done uh, to help with the cost of capital and and that may be an area where it, it wouldn't be completely necessary to depend on uh, the uk government even if that may be the the, the surest and and favored route uh, by a lot of the people in the sector um, we are very welcome the, the PPA proposals that are within the strategy, but um, a lot of the analysis within the industry shows that market's not really going to be big enough to bring forward the level of investment and the level of capacity in terms of onshore winds and other renewables that we need. So it's a, it's a great option. Um, it will work for some projects, and we're fantastic to see the support for that in the strategy, but in and of itself, it's not going to be enough. So we would still uh, call for that pot one auction to be held in 2018-19. Um, very quick follow-up from Jackie Bailey and then on to a question from Gil Patterson. Very quick. We, we all welcome any additional jobs that would arise as a result of this, but isn't it the case that existing jobs with existing investment have principally gone abroad because that's where the turbines are manufactured? And is there anything to suggest that that wouldn't be the case with the 14,000 jobs that are predicted? Our analysis is that we would have an extra billion pounds of investment in Scotland from delivery of that one gigawatt. Um, but there's lots of opportunities now in terms of repowering as well that's coming up. So we're seeing lots of indigenous Scottish companies coming speaking to us a lot more about the repowering market and opportunities that are in there. Again, I think trying to seize some of the jobs and the opportunity that may have initially with the first tranche of onshore winds being delivered uh, elsewhere in the country. And when we're seeing with the offshore winds, there's a huge amount of investment and job creation 
creation, new job creation happening within the UK and within Scotland as well. So we've seen people getting excited about this next phase coming forward. Gil Patterson. Well, thanks very much, Convener. Um, Joan McNaughton already raised this in her uh, first answer to the, to the committee, and it's in thermal electricity generation. I wonder if I can ask the rest of the panel uh, if new thermal capacity is considered to, to actually be important and under what scenario Scotland might need the new thermal capacity. And maybe I could link another question to it, uh, and that is would you consider whether re-empowering existing large-scale electricity generating uh, uh, sites is more desirable than constructing a new one, and if so, why? Um, Duncan Burt. Yeah, um, there's. A, I mean, Scotland has a very diverse range of generation sources, as I'm sure you've covered already. Um, significant existing nuclear, um, alongside very large amounts of onshore and soon offshore wind. Um, there's a large amount of hydro as well. Uh, thermal capacity is, we see, a, a very useful part of that mix. Um, it provides capability to output power when, when the wind isn't blowing or when the sun isn't shining, or indeed if we have a particularly dry winter. It's not absolutely essential for the operation of the grid to have that thermal capacity in Scotland. We can operate the grid without it. Um, operating the grid without any large power stations, as we foresee that we will have to do potentially towards the back end of the next decade, uh, with the potential closure of the nuclear sites as well, does present some additional challenges, which we're still working on. Um, we know that we can do it. Uh, it's just a question of the timing of investment and the technical measures that we need to take it. But nevertheless, on the one hand, I will say that we can do it. It's also very helpful to have that thermal generation there to help back up and support the grid. Uh, Lawrence Slade. I think just to support what Duncan's saying there, uh, and refer back to one of my earlier comments that the the way the system is operating is or operated has changed quite dramatically um, in the matter of a few short years, and the way that we are looking at how generation is provided to the grid, and the way that, for example, uh, distributive generation is coming into play, combined heat and power storage that we've mentioned already. So I think to to support what Duncan is saying, basically you've got to look at this from from all sources of input into the grid and how you can bring those to play into a more dynamic grid going forward into the future, but also look at the way that uh, the capacity market is functioning and how the energy market reform has processed in terms of bringing new generation into play, looking ahead several years. So you've got that ability to plan and you've got that ability to provide investors in confidence as to where things are going. Gina Hanrahan. Um, we commissioned some work a number of years ago to look at a kind of post-Hunterston, post-Torness, uh, post-Peterhead world where there mightn't be uh, thermal capacity in Scotland to see was security of supply delivered. And uh, the analysis was done for us at the time by uh, energy consultancy DNVGL. Um, and they found that in order to meet peak demand, um, that Scotland would have security of supply in the absence of, um, of thermal capacity in Scotland. Um, and even under an extended period of low renewables, that security of supply was maintained. I think, as Duncan says, it's not essential to have thermal capacity here. Things can be done uh, in, in its absence. I think there are questions around wider system resilience that we need to um, to think through very carefully. We have to ensure that the system is absolutely resilient as we decarbonise, and perhaps Duncan can pick up on, on that a little bit more. Um, but I thought what was really interesting in the strategy was um, its uh, description of the uh, innovative work that's being undertaken to uh, assess how small-scale distributed generation could play a role in maintaining system resilience, that we don't have to think in the old norms of the past, which are all about base load generation. Now we're in a much more distributed, decentralised model where there are new system services being provided by new technologies. And I think perhaps if Duncan could pick up on that, that would be useful. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Gina. I, I'm being brief in my first answer. I could talk on this for hours, obviously, so I'll, I'll try and go one level lower. And that is, I think uh, Joan said earlier that you know, we can we can see the world changing. We're trying to get that balance between markets and upfront regulation and direction right. Because actually, we 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 can see a number of ways in which 
the supply of electricity will evolve over the next 15 and 20 years. Uh, as Gina says, we can see very large amounts of distributed generation coming on, probably more than 50%. Certainly, we operate at that kind of level in Scotland. Um, a, a very significant potential role for storage, both highly distributed storage and also much larger cell storage. And I think the one really important point to pick up on the strategy is, is not just the recognition of the very important future that Scotland can play in terms of pumped hydro storage, for which it has significant additional capacity, but also that there's a very big and burgeoning global growth in battery storage, uh, which may also play a very important role in Scotland. Um, those factors combined with very large amount of distributed energy and the potential for interconnection or further interconnection into Scotland all impinge on that resilience question post the closure of Torness and Hunterston. And so I, I, I don't want to give a non-answer, I want to give a very clear answer, but that clear answer is that there are a number of possible futures. Uh, we need to watch and track them very carefully and our intention is to work very closely with developers and investors in all sorts of markets to understand their appetite, uh, to make sure that we have viable routes to ensure that we have a resilient system. Um, one final point is that it's important to recognise that networks, I think, will play a growing role in that resilience over the next 15 years. We already see that the security of the Scottish network with reduced thermal power is currently secured by um, the additional network investments made by Scottish Power and Scottish and Southern over the last 10 years, both to help export renewables from Scotland, but also help bring power into Scotland uh, when those renewables aren't running. And I think additionally, a, a growing focus on ensuring that we have a resilient network will be really important. Uh, Mark Winston. Yeah, I, I mean, I just want to uh, say something a, a little different, which is... Um, you know, from a consumer point of view, uh, the extent to which power is supplied by sort of distributed local balancing, local storage versus large scale, large scale power generation and large scale storage. Um, to some extent, the, the question about that in terms of consumer appetite is about, OK, uh, what does it mean for me in terms of how much I'm going to pay for this? So. I, I sometimes think we're, we, we do get very caught up in conversations because we spend a lot of time talking to uh, entrepreneurs, uh, aggregators, and so on, who, are, who are, you know, can spot the opportunity. And this you know, undoubtedly will be a, 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 an increasing part of the way uh, the, uh, the makeup of the energy system. But I think, I think the point about uh, trying to keep an, a, an overall kind of understanding about its implications for total system cost, because distributed generation still relies on um, large-scale systems to, 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 to provide kind of overall balancing and reserve and so on. So um, it sometimes feels like more of everything to me. And I, I think we just need to be careful about the extent to which you know, we're, we're covering the total system cost of some of these you know, uh, interesting, very dynamic opportunities. And there's, there's lots of cost reduction happening. Um, but there's also still lots of kind of cost reduction to get out of, um, you know, for example, uh, electrical storage, battery storage, um, compared to, 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 to more, you know, more conventional ways of pr producing flexibility. So I, I do think this is a very kind of evolving piece, but we shouldn't lose sight of total system cost and its impact on consumer bills. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that's it's quite clear that there's a, a reluctance to invest in new capacity, thermal capacity. I think we've got a particular problem in Scotland uh, simply because of the cost of tra transmission. And, I mean, entrepreneurs, uh, that's exactly what they are. They're not charities. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's difficult for me to understand why why they would invest here in Scotland because of this UK system that we've got. So, what can we do about that? Uh, and is there not a need for uh, some strategic thinking that we're dependent on someone else supplying the backup when when we're short of electricity, if the wind stops blowing, for instance? Um, John McNaughton and Duncan Burke. Um, I. Uh, I may get shocked by, by Lawrence Slade for saying this, but I've talked to quite a lot of the companies in um, uh, south of the border to various people, and none of them would invest south of the border at the moment in new thermal capacity, uh, because the 
uh, incentives are, are, are not adequate uh, for an investment in a, a, a new uh, a thermal power station. There may be somebody out there who's, who's just on the point of doing it to falsify what I've said, but uh, the general uh, 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 consensus that I pick up is, is that the, the overall system, the mix of um, uh, instruments at the moment is not conducive uh, to reaching a, an investment decision on a large power station. And um, I, uh, I, I think added to that, uh, you have at the moment uh, a, a, a view of um, not huge demand growth, although as electric vehicles penetrate and as um, uh, we move to decarbonising the heat sector over times to come, then, then that demand will grow, will have to grow, but uh, people are waiting to see how quickly that happens and how quickly and consistently the policies drive those processes uh, before they would take a, a decision. On your point about backup, um, I, I mean, I don't uh, think we should um, uh, uh, overlook the huge cost and other benefits of backup through greater connectivity. Um, it's uh, another uh, reason for sadness in terms of the uh, uh, vote to leave the European Union, uh, because there we were moving to a much more integrated uh, energy market on both electricity and gas, which had cost and performance benefits uh, across uh, the region. But it's possible still to have interconnection, even if we're not part of that uh, market. But we'll have to be very uh, uh, careful and serious about the kind of um, uh, negotiations we have over the terms of trade, if you will, on the interconnection. Uh, that is not impossible. It helps that our system operator uh, has played a very leading role in that um, uh, integration in, in years past and is well respected. And I think operator to operator, uh, we may continue to enjoy legacy benefits, if you will. Uh, but I wouldn't discount the, the cost and other benefits of interconnection just because, you know, uh, problems over supply, peaks of demand all vary in different places, and so you get some benefits just from wanting the stuff at a different time or having it available at a different time. I'll give a right to reply to Lauren Slade before we move on to Duncan Burt, and then a question from John Mason. Um, yeah, just three very quickly. I don't necessarily disagree with what Joan said, but I think the, 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 the policies that we have in place now will provide the signals to investors. Investors will invest logically when they see the appropriate signals in place. The forecasts that take place as part of the capacity market indicate how much um, generation capacity uh, grid and UK government are looking for one year ahead in the shorter auction, four years ahead in long-term auction. Those forecasts will take into account when plants coming offline, it will take into account um, demand growth, etc. Those are the signals for a GB-wide system uh, that investors will respond in. Now, there are other factors as to location issues, etc., that come into that part, but that's what the EMR process was designed for. That's what the capacity market is designed for. We, the industry, can't forecast what those numbers will be next year, year after, year after, but there are various economic models that, that look at that. I also, though, we haven't really mentioned and talked about uh, demand side reduction, DSR, at scale. And I think the, the other element to all of this is, as I said before, how new technologies can be brought to bear. And if you like, how the toolbox that GRID have at hand is expanding as we harness new technologies, and as most importantly, we prove that they can be delivered. Um, lastly, before I hand over to Duncan, a point on interconnectors. Um, I don't think we can underestimate the value of interconnective interconnectivity, both in terms of the GB system and also out to the island of Ireland, but also our interconnectivity with uh, the near continent and some of the future plans for interconnections into Norway, for example, with 100% renewable energy. Um, I also think, having been involved in some early discussions in Brussels around this point, uh, there are there is significant economic logic 
in the relationship, certainly around electricity and interconnectivity of Europe being maintained. There's a value to the continent in interconnectivity. There's a value to the GB system uh, in interconnectivity. And I, that shouldn't be lost when uh, political discussions start as opposed to industry discussions. Thanks, Lawrence. Yeah, I, I mean, I would echo much of what Joan and Lawrence are saying. So just to, to pick up some of those key points in terms of uh, charging and, and the cost of the network. So we, we see continued very active interest in the development of renewable energy in Scotland, which is a good sign for us. And we have continued growth this year and next year in terms of those connections against the backdrop of the current charging framework, uh, which gives us good encouragement. Those costs are reflecting the very significant upgrades going on in Scotland to facilitate the connection of, of that capacity. Um, alongside that, if we step back, um, there are a number of tools that we can use to help, as you say, take that strategic view of where the, where the grid is going and where resilience is going over the next 15 years. It is, it is really key that we do that. The measures that came in with the EMR and the capacity mechanism are part of that to take a longer term view as to how we need capacity. Alongside that, we do a lot of work um, in our future energy scenarios and our system operability framework that are looking very carefully and stepwise at the next 30, 40 years out to 2050 and beyond as to what and where we might need things in order to continue to enjoy the level of reliability that we've had. Um, those, the big four axes in terms of flexibility and how we operate the grid really are to pick up many of the nouns we've used already, interconnection and the enlargement and the spreading of the burden of security of supply across larger markets, which both increases the resilience of our own supply and also reduces costs to consumers by enlarging the market within which we trade. And we hope to continue that very active trading and enlargement of markets, even uh, through Brexit. After interconnection, we have the growth of storage, albeit with questions around costs of battery, but pump storage as well. Um, existing infrastructure around thermal plant, uh, new and existing, and small and large. And um, also on top of that, we haven't, I haven't touched on this yet, but a very significant opportunity in demand side response, where we run a very large GB wide campaign called Power Responsive, which is really around engaging major users, particularly industrial and commercial at this stage, in much more active management of their demand to both lower the carbon footprint of the energy that they take and also reduce their costs, because energy tends to be cheaper <coughs> when renewables are high. And we see that scale of demand side response growth as something really fundamental to having a low carbon, active and flexible electricity market in the future. At the moment, it's really industrial and commercial. If you roll into the 2020s, you come into a major smart metering program rollout, and the impacts of that, we hope, will also be beneficial. So interconnection, storage, demand side response and thermal all play a really big role in that. We look, we'll look at that strategically, we will continue to, and think about whether the charges and frameworks that we have in place right across the regulatory framework are giving the right signals in the right way, including location of thermal plant. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, chapter 4 of the Energy Strategy talks about transforming Scotland's energy use and there are various uh, actions, but uh, one of the actions it says the Scottish Government will make significant investment and employ targeted regulation to make Scotland's buildings near zero carbon by 2050 in a way that is socially and economically sustainable and supports Scotland's long-term inclusive growth. So I suppose I'm wondering, uh, is that realistic? Is that an achievable statement? Who would like to answer? Um, Gina and then Joe. Uh, the transformation of Scotland's buildings is absolutely essential if we're going to meet our climate change targets out to 2050. So that's something that we uh, know is a relatively uh, low cost um, step that you would take in the overall decarbonisation uh, buildings and heat or building uh, energy efficiency would come first um, and, and uh, heat decarbonisation slightly later. But absolutely, we need to get on with um, making sure that we have zero carbon homes in Scotland. Um, we have, alongside all these various different consultation documents, a consultation that's out at the moment on the SEEP Energy Efficiency Programme, which is due to run for the domestic and non-domestic sectors through to the kind of late 2030s, um, which should uh, transform Scotland's 
built environment uh, massively. Um, we would argue that the targets that are set out for that at the moment are uh, relatively weak, that the measures that are put in place aren't uh, happening at the pace that they should uh, over the next decade to pull people out of fuel poverty and deliver the emission savings that we need to see. So there's been a very um, Broad, uh, broadly supported campaign to uh, ask the Scottish Government to make all homes uh, reach an energy performance uh, standard of C by 2025 as an important milestone for SEEP. And that needs to be backed by the right financial incentives. Um, the capital budget has a role to play in that, but we also have to unlock private sector investment. And one of the key ways that we can do that is to regulate buildings um, in order to drive uptake of energy efficiency measures. And one of the very welcome things that's uh, emerged over the last uh, couple of months is another consultation <laughs> on the regulation of energy efficiency in the private rented sector for Scotland. And the Scottish Government is, is uh, proposing to introduce new regulation for 2019 that um, the worst performing properties will, will have to be brought up to an energy performance standard of E uh, with a view to meeting a D standard in 2022. So that will definitely help to um, regulate out, I suppose, the worst performing properties. But this is a very, very long scale uh, programme. We need to be very clear about what the targets and milestones are for it. Uh, and we need also, I think, to do a lot more work to engage the non-domestic sector in what it means for them. Uh, I because you mentioned both. I mean, is there more of a challenge in the domestic or more of a challenge in the non-domestic? I think there's a there's a massive challenge in terms of consumer engagement and getting into people's homes. So, that, you know, there, there are so many homes in Scotland that we will have to tackle if we uh, are to achieve uh, proper uh, heat decarbonisation and, and well-insulated homes. Um, but yes, I think there, one of the things that has come out of the strategy is that there hasn't yet been the kind of level of engagement with the commercial sector on uh, energy efficiency and heat decarbonisation that we need to see. Um, we, there, there's a huge challenge there as well, um, and we need to engage closely over the next few years in the design and delivery of SEEP so that we're maximising uh, the co-benefits of doing, uh, say, commercial and non-domestic at the same time as domestic where we can where there are synergies. John McNaughton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, sometimes you see your past life flash before you. Uh, when I was working for the UK government, uh, from which I retired in 2007, uh, we did a lot of work on a zero carbon home standard. It was indeed introduced and it was to have been enacted for all new build from 2016. I think Lawrence referred to uh, political decisions uh, that um, uh, uh, regulation was overturned uh, after the 2015 e election, Westminster election. Um, there is no reason at all why we shouldn't have uh, that kind of requirement for all new build. Uh, we're way behind most of our continental uh, c partners uh, on uh, what we require of our housing stock. Retrofit's a bit more difficult, and I don't feel uh, particularly qualified either to agree that it's a uh, you know, rather uh, leisurely pace of um, uh, progress or uh, that it's very demanding, um, but I suspect that if you uh, upped the ambition, uh, then you, you just upped the pace, and whether you met the whole ambition or not, you'd certainly uh, do better. Um, but key to this is uh, in the uh, domestic sector is enforcement, because there's a long tradition of building regulations actually uh, sort of being absolutely complied with, if I can put it that way. Uh, and I think uh, good enforcement is crucial. Uh, but with the enforcement and with the right approach on the regulation, uh, particularly to retrofit, you'd have, again, considerable benefits in terms of um, uh, jobs and the co-benefit on, on fuel poverty. On non-domestic, I think it ought to be more straightforward, actually. I mean, we've had quite a lot of really good work done by the Carbon Trust uh, uh, around working with businesses to get them to understand its enlightened self-interest and it feeds straight through into the bottom line because you're taking a cost out of the business. I mean, uh, somebody said that business buildings are much more varied and that makes it more difficult? 
Uh, well, I, I personally think that you would then consult with um, the business sector around how you will get a regulation that uh, works, and you can have a principle-based regulation, you can have an intensity or square footage-based uh, regulation. There are ways around that you can do. But I think one of the key things for businesses uh, is to know that everyone else is in the same boat and that's why regulation is important to drive it uh, because if all shops have to uh, uh, abide by the same thing then you're not giving one a competitive advantage to uh, another um, and um, you're giving people the clarity that they've they've got to do it but that's for consultation on on pace and on uh, the specific framing and making the framing quite goal oriented gets you uh, a long way towards avoiding problems over things like the, the variation uh, in the stock. Um, and it just raises it on the business agenda because one of the problems is that if you're a very energy intensive user, you're onto this already. Um, and if you're a, a really small business, you're probably onto it because it's one of the things you do. The, you know, um, but but the medium-sized businesses, it's just not necessarily high enough up the agenda. Um, briefly from Mark Winskill, and then we'll move on to a question from Jackie Bailey. Yeah. I, I, so I just wanted to, because I think the question was about 2050, but I, I, there is a lot happening in this particular kind of part of the system immediately. As, uh, as Gina said, there's, there's a, some of the more specific consultations that are running in parallel with the energy strategy are uh, quite kind of uh, detailed in terms of powers to local authorities in this area. And what we expect from local authorities in terms of delivering SEEP is a, is a huge issue, as well as the local heat and energy efficiency strategy. So I've been involved in some of those consultations, and I know there's kind of a, quite a lot of concern at local authority le level about their capacity to take on board some of the responsibilities that are built into these more specific consultations. And we do need to kind of think about where it's appropriate for Scottish Government to provide a kind of central uh, capacity to help local authorities. Because the level of this, the pace of change built into uh, SEEP and LEASE, um, so SEEP is talking about 10 billion spend over the, over the period of 2025, of which half of that would be public money, around about half of public money according to the existing Home, Homes Alliance. This is a huge kind of, program, a national program, um, and there are, there are questions about the relative degree of getting demand down before you uh, think about low carbon heat supply, because you're going a long way to, to minimise the level of uh, intervention in, in the supply problem if you're able to do the, the demand side r rightly. Um, but I think, I think this is one where, you know, the committee, uh, the, 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 there needs to be a lot more kind of thought about what's going to happen over the next 10 years, because there's, there's a lot of things happening already in terms of uh, regulatory uh, consultation and so on. Um, I wonder whether I could neatly kind of seek into um, demand side reduction and energy efficiency more generally. Um, I'm very conscious the Scottish Government um, helpfully exceeded their target last time round by a couple of percentage points, but obviously the EU have set a new target of 30% by 2030. And I wonder whether um, some of our witnesses, and maybe I could start with June, um, think that that's where we should be positioning the Scottish strategy. And I am a lover of timetables and you know action plans so that we can measure as we go along exactly what we're doing. Would that be a sensible approach? And let me just throw in one final thing. Um, should we be looking to measure the final energy consumption and a reduction in that, or should we allow for the impact of things like economic cycle, weather, which is a key talking point in Scotland always, um, and energy prices as well? Um, I think there would be advantage to aligning um, with the uh, EU, and as I've said before, I think the um, uh, the extent of control over the potential for energy efficiency uh, up here suggests to me that that's one to prioritise. Uh, it also does help with some of the other targets, like the percentage of, of renewable energy. Um, one of the um, uh, concerns I have, it's not very uh, much uh, um, uh, laboured in, in the energy strategy, but I think 
too much weight is being placed on the potential of smart meters for demand side. Uh, I actually think smart meters are going to be the new uh, dog that doesn't bark in the way that people don't switch. I mean, there are reasons for that, and I think the reasons are very similar. Uh, and uh, I, I just uh, think that it will be wise not to place too much reliance on the contribution that can be made from uh, smart uh, meters. In terms of how you measure it, I know that um, uh, looking at uh, usage and forecasts, um, uh, often uh, the people involved can uh, produce uh, temperature-adjusted uh, statistics. And my um, uh, suggestion will be actually we need we all, you always need the actuals. Then, if you're looking for your trend, you need to correct for variations uh, in relevant factors like weather. So there's no point in saying you've done terribly well uh, last winter if last winter was much warmer in terms of demand for heat uh, reducing. Um, but then you need to understand whether that's a structural adjustment or a one-off, um, what it means for uh, your strategy and uh, 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 your, your targets. Um, we uh, would be very supportive of uh, setting an ambitious target for Scotland for 2030. I think there's an issue about to what extent we align exactly with the EU target or perhaps go further in terms of how it's expressed. The EU target is measured slightly differently from how we measure it at the moment in Scotland, which is in terms of final energy demand in Scotland. And I think that there would be enormous value to continuing with the approach that we currently have. We're showing it's working, we're exceeding the target, why would we change what's already uh, what's already uh, clearly working? Um, the EU has examined a number of different scenarios for the 2030 uh, timeframe, and their analysis, which I think is done by Cambridge Econometrics for the European Commission, shows that there are massive macroeconomic benefits to the EU as a whole in terms of GDP growth, job creation, um, fossil fuel imports, and even things like health uh, bills. Um, if we go slightly further on energy efficiency than what's currently being considered at an EU level. So what we would advocate is that Scotland uh, sets a 30% final energy demand reduction target uh, for 2030. We think that there are huge uh, benefits to that. Um, but that has to be backed by appropriate actions to actually deliver on it. And we're back to that point that we made at the beginning. The strategy is very good in terms of overall description of where we want to be, but not so good in terms of the action plan to deliver, particularly in areas like heat and transport. We know we could be doing more uh, in off-gas grid homes now to uh, to uh, enhance take-up. We know we could be doing more of energy on energy efficiency um, uh, in, in buildings, and we also know that we need to put in place some actions to deliver demand reduction in transport, otherwise there will be impacts on the electricity grid if everybody shifts wholly to electric vehicles, but we don't do things like try and shift people from those vehicles in the first place through things like low emission zones or workplace parking levies or other measures. Duncan Burt wanted to come in. Yeah, I, just to recognise a couple of points there. So we would absolutely endorse, if you're looking at the long-term trend, you've got to temperature correct out for seasonal weather. For example, 2010 was a very cold year, and you can see that on the graphs, even in the strategy. Um, and secondly, that you can consider the next 10 years really as, in terms of decarbonisation as heat, it's sort of the calm before the storm. You know, we've got... We've, before we re before we we expect decarbonisation of heat to really start deeply penetrating into uh, the building infrastructure of of the UK and of Scotland, and you can see energy efficiency, insulation, and energy efficiency is an infrastructure in its own right, and getting ahead of the curve and and reducing demand now has a double whammy of not only capturing those efficiency benefits immediately, but also it reduces how much you have to spend on decarbonisation later on as well, exactly as uh, Mark was saying earlier. So, yes, we should temperature correct and look for trends. E economic conditions and weather are the main two that we correct for, but getting ahead of the curve gives you a, a two, two bangs for your buck. Thank you. Uh, question now from Ash Denham. I'm interested in the panel's views on the proposal for a government-owned energy company and whether the panel think that would help to support um, the development of local and community energy. And then also linked to that, the proposal for the Scottish Renewable Energy Bond, 
and again, whether that would allow savers or investors to support the renewable sector. Uh, Nicholas Gubbins. When we first heard of that, we sort of were a little uh, mixed in our response, and we felt perhaps it was a, an idea looking for a problem. Um, but having worked through it in a bit more detail, and certainly from the community perspective, uh, if we're going to see more and more extensive community-owned or community-engaged um, energy developments, um, we're going to need to have much better economies of scale. Um, and we think that there are a number of sort of collective and facilitative roles that could be undertaken by some form of sort of coordinating organisation. It doesn't necessarily have to be a government one, but if there were such a, an organisation, then it could assist uh, in a number of quite useful ways um, both in terms of new project development and also in um, helping to underwrite or guarantee or uh, assist in the various things necessary to generate those economies of scale. Lindsay Roberts. Um, so I'd, I'd agree with a lot of those comments as well. I mean, I think from from our perspective, it depends. In the meetings I've been at with Scottish government officials and other stakeholders, it really depends where you start the conversation, where you end up deciding what it should be. So it depends the stakeholders in the room and what their interests are. And it's been from everything from a supply company through to a project developer um, through to just an information service provider. Um, and we don't seem to be any closer to narrowing down exactly what it should be doing. So, I mean, we agree with what's strategy says if it's created it has to add value it shouldn't be duplicating uh, things that are out there already um, but we're, we're kind of um, coming around to the view that it could be a very useful mechanism as a front door because there are a huge number of uh, projects and um, organizations out there to help communities but sometimes it's really difficult to know because there's so much support who do you go to first which doorbell do you knock on and it's that kind of one-stop shop that begins to open that up for a community um, and, and help them to, to travel through the project development uh, process or, or however it is that they're looking to get involved uh, with renewable energy. Um, in terms of the bonds, so we actually, we had a paper produced for us by Snell Bridge uh, a wee while ago that was looking at the creation of a renewable energy bond. So again, we welcome its inclusion uh, in the strategy. It's not a new idea by any stretch of the imagination, but we think there is something that could be done with existing community-owned reef assets uh, that would, would help, again, communities be investing in these projects through this kind of mechanism. So it's a very, very early stage proposal from us. We recognise it needs a lot more input from financial experts and legal experts as well as how it's work, but we're uh, pleased to see the idea in the strategy and welcome working more closely with the Scottish Government on its development. John McNaughton. Um, I agree with the, the two previous uh, contributions, but I just wanted to raise one other issue on this chapter, um, if it's the appropriate time, and that is that uh, after a discussion around delivery, uh, I think we then came to the government-owned energy company uh, concept. Um, and, you know, it's fine uh, for the, the purpose for which it's um, uh, uh, devised. But I think what I'm seeing is a lack of machinery for ensuring that the overall delivery is integrated. We started off by talking about the whole systems. A lot of these individual uh, policy areas will be owned in different bits of government. Uh, they seem to have been coordinated rather effectively by the Cabinet Secretary-led committee in terms of the aspirations of the strategy. But I think how you execute that is just as important and I don't think you can have that oversight uh, by a piece of as it were um, policy machinery uh, at, at the political level. I think you need something uh, that is uh, closer to the practical side and some of the examples that were cited in the chapter if my memory serves me correctly um, are actually designed to do that I mean I think the Swedish Energy Agency in particular is there to uh, help 
oversee execution and make sure that it's uh, delivered in an integrated way across all the different sectors. So for me, that's a, a question mark about, uh, I think that may be a gap and I think it maybe needs to be filled. And I think there's a case for a bit of machinery that is distinct from the economic regulator and distinct from government, but which has an accountability to report on what's actually being delivered to spot problems uh, uh, before they become a matter of post hoc accountability uh, for, for not having been solved. Uh, Mark Winscombe. Yeah. Uh, so I, do, I don't think there's any kind of uh, straightforward answer to this. Uh, I, I, again, was one of these areas where we're, we're, we're sort of rather lacking detail in terms of what the government has in mind in terms of the government-owned government energy company. But uh, uh, Joan, Joan's right. I think it's the Danish Energy Agency that the government are particularly interested in. I don't know a lot about that, but I think it is quite directive in terms of central government, in the Danish case, uh, issuing kind of implementation plans to, to local authorities and, and so on. That's a very different system where local authorities have a lot of control over their system. It's, it's, so that would be quite a radical kind of change in terms, or we'd have to think very carefully about how that would would be applied to, 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 to the um, to the UK system, I, you know, I, I think a lot of these areas, we, there's an option of, of improved regulation of the existing kind of ownership uh, base rather than something a bit more transformative. Um, one other just thing, I, I suppose we're getting to the end, but I think there is a bit of apparatus about, um, given that this is such a dynamic kind of picture in terms of the degree to which this will be a, a, a highly decentralised system or, or uh, we're still relying, uh, you know, uh, on, on more kind of um, national and international scale systems. I think there is a kind of challenge for any implementation bo body in terms of understanding the evidence base, understanding how long-term plans need to be in terms of attracting investment and remaking that in the light of changing evidence. I think one of the problems we've seen with the, the, the energy strategy is that, you know, um, the government is trying to do that to some extent, be the analytical body, as well as the kind of implementation body. And that's quite difficult because the analysis becomes wrapped up in the sort of uh, the, the, the political settlement. So I think there is some separation of um, independent analytical assessment and then advising government. Uh, that, that area needs strengthening in, in the Scottish case. It's, it's rather kind of, it, 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 there's some suggestion of that later on, but um, I think you know the role for Committee on Climate Change or, or a similar type body based in Scotland, as the evidence base is so dynamic. I think that's going to be really useful going ahead. Um, just, just two very brief points. One is that there's a Danish energy agency. There is also a Swedish energy agency, which has the role I described. Um, but secondly, uh, I had the Committee on Climate Change uh, in mind when I was talking about post hoc accountability. It's not there to spot problems early on and to uh, help people to devise solutions. So although it's doing great work, I don't think it's quite the kind of body that you need for the kind of role uh, that I would like to see, which is around implementation and separating it off from uh, the uh, the the policy uh, development process, if you will. Thank you. No, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I just want to get the panel's views on, on community and locally owned energy. The, the strategy includes a new target of two gigawatts by, by 2030 in the sector. And of course, the sector is quite um, under um, uh, developed in the UK and Scotland in comparison to some other European countries. But I was just wondering what the relevance of this target is to delivering the energy strategy, and in particular, given that 90% um, of, of this uh, capacity is, is not community-owned, it's locally owned, um, whether we need to kind of look at that definition as well, how relevant is that? I mean, one or two of the projects I was looking at under that are actually not owned even in the UK. I mean, they're actually owned in the Netherlands and other European countries. I think that was me. Sorry, Nicholas, Nicholas <laughs> Collins. Um, I, I pick up that there's a bit of a re sort of a retreat from community ownership in the strategy, which uh, I may be a bit oversensitive on that. But uh, I, I, and I think in answer to your question, um, it depends on what our, our sort of mindset is on the value of community-led projects. Uh, we think very strongly that. Uh, we're only going to meet these overall targets if we have a very engaged and informed 
uh, public, which is, in our experience, been driven massively by uh, community energy groups, local groups, who have been very active locally in, in developing and changing perceptions about what energy is about through the medium of developing a project. It may be an advanced multi-million pound wind farm, or it could be just a small sort of facilities associated project. So I, 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 it's not so much in my view uh, whether it's really significant or not. I would argue that we, we will never possibly get to the point that we're wanting to get through, and as expressed in the ambition of this strategy, unless we have that level of engagement and, in our view, a continuing and higher level of community-owned and partnership type projects. Uh, Lindsay Roberts. Um, yeah, we'd certainly support um, more actions in the strategy for um, community owned projects. Um, I think it's increasingly challenging in the competitive subsidy environment as well for communities to engage and understand and accept the risk profile that exists in that environment. And with the closure of the feed-in tariff as well, clearly in the smaller scale project sector there are serious challenges too. Um, and there is, I think, a bit lacking in the strategy in terms of its support for feed-in tariff smaller scale projects are more likely to be uh, those community-led projects. Um, where you're going to see achievement of those targets. The uh, other target that's in there is around shared ownership as well. So we have um, a lot of companies working and have actively uh, working and have actively delivered shared ownership projects to date. But also that's another incredibly, incredibly challenging target and I think is going to be very uh, difficult to implement in practice, again, given that um, this, the framework that we're working in in terms of the CFD and it's that understanding of the risk profile and what is a fair and acceptable risk to expose communities to and how you then account for that in a planning process. There's lots of, it's a, something we, we all know the end point that we want to get to and what we want to achieve but how we get there is, is very difficult so there's lots of nitty gritty that we need to be working out through the energy strategy, through the onshore wind policy statement and through guidance that's being produced by Local Energy Scotland with the Scottish Government at the moment on that so um, as well as I wouldn't take my eye off the ball in terms of the challenges with the shared ownership target as well as the community owned target as well. Lauren Slade. To finish off on that point actually I think there's a there's a good role to play here for for good solid policy and regulation that relates to those targets because I think to pick up on Lindsay's point around the level of risk that you're exposing a community to a community is likely to be um, less or more risk averse than some commercial institutions. So if you've got the right policy and regulatory framework in place that provides investors and financiers with the reassurance around their return, it can provide the reassurance to local communities around their risk level. So I think on this point, target supported in terms of how you bring that in, but be very careful about how you then link that into regulatory and policy um, regimes so you can give uh, local communities that, that comfort factor, if you will, about the level of risk that they're taking on. Okay. Uh, well, I think we're about at the close of our session. Did any committee member have a follow-up on any point that um, had arisen? Um, Gordon MacDonald? Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the, the importance of interconnection. Uh, you talked uh, earlier on about um, thermal demand, um, baseload demand being supplied from south of the border um, if there wasn't, uh, you know, Hunterson or, or Torness. Um, can you say something about the importance of the interconnection with France and with Netherlands? I mean, my understanding of the final figures that um, for 2015, which is the last year that they're complete, um, France, we imported 14,000 gigawatt hours and exported 174. In Netherlands, we um, imported 8,000 gigawatt hours and exported seven. Um, can you just say the importance of interconnectors, whether that's going to get worse or better over the years, and in the result of a Brexit negotiation, what impact that could have on UK generation and Scottish energy strategy? Um, my reference to interconnectors is really about the existing, but also the future interconnectors as well. So we have potentially additional interconnectors with France. Um, across, well, right around the North Sea, actually, um, up towards Norway, both into England and Norway into Scotland. And those interconnectors, what, what they can do is provide swing. 
So they can feed into the UK when we've got reduced renewables output in the UK, and then they can take some of that renewables output and help push it out into the continent when, when we've got an excess. And so they help, they help stabilise the price for power in the UK. They help investment as well. So that's what they're doing. Those numbers you've got at the moment in terms of the current flow sound about right. At the moment we see um, you know, typically a, a, a balance to flow. When we have high renewables in the UK, we see flow going out. Uh, at other times, we see flow very often coming in because of renewables in Germany. Um, as, as we look at Brexit, clearly there's a whole uh, world of negotiations to happen before we get anywhere near that. Uh, we've said that there are real benefits to being uh, still part of the integrated energy internal energy market or as uh, well integrated into that broader European energy market from which we derive a lot of benefits in terms of trade and security. Okay. Well, thank you very much to all of our guests for coming today. And uh, that concludes this session. I'll suspend the session uh, for those members of the public sitting in the gallery. We will recommence at 12 o'clock. Thank you.